This past week, many of us are aware that 22 students who were on their knees praying in a Christian union meeting became martyrs for their faith. In a horrific attack that began there but spread out to the rest of the university in Garissa, a total of 142 students lost their lives this week in this horrific terrorist attack. Six others, both national and security officers that were in charge of the institution, lost their lives. But on this Easter, allow me to focus our reflections, our thoughts, together as a church, on the 22 students. These 22 students that have joined the League of Martyrs, the League of those that have lost their lives as they stood for their faith. Not just them alone, but there are many, many other students in this university this week that lost their lives. There are many others, not this week, but even throughout history that have lost their lives in defense as they represented and as they stood for their faith. Today, allow me to ask the people that have gone before us to challenge us and to speak back to us as those that are of the faith and are still alive. Today, allow us to hear what that sacrifice is about, to hear what they would tell us as believers that are alive in this nation today. You see, a research was done by Gordon Cornwell Seminary, and in this research, they found out that one million people have already died for their faith between the year 2000 and the year 2010. Already one million people have died. In the same research, they discovered that actually 100,000 people die every year because of their faith. Many of us remember in 2013 where gunmen on motorcycles killed three people. They opened fire on a wedding party that was outside a Coptic Christian church in Cairo and they massacred people. In the same year, twin suicide bombings happened and 75 people were killed outside a church in Pakistan. And many of us remember because it's very vivid in our minds. Just two months ago, barely two months ago, 21 Christians were beheaded in Libya. Many of us saw the chilling images of victims walking to their death on the shores of Tripoli as these images shocked the world. The Greek word for witness is the word matrus. And matrus is where we get the English word for martyr. Martyr. Those who have died for their witness, for their faith, for them standing for their faith. Today I want us to reflect on those that have died as they have stood for their faith. I want us to reflect on the death that happened this week and its implications to us as believers, its implications to us as those of the Christian faith. Because many, many have died because of their faith. Let me take a step back and remind us of people like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was imprisoned and beheaded by Herod. Matthew, one of the disciples, we remember Matthew and how he wrote his account in the Gospels. Matthew was actually martyred by the sword while he continued to spread the good news in Ethiopia. Many of us remember Mark. Do you know Mark 
was tied at his feet on a rope that was tied to a horse. And the horse was dragged around the city of Alexandria in Egypt. And the horse went round and round as Matthew was being dragged on his, on his back. And he went round and round the city until Matthew died as his feet were being dragged. Luke was hanged in Greece. Many of us remember John the Revelator, the one that wrote Revelation, the first and second and the third of John in the scriptures. John was actually brought down head first into boiling oil. But somehow he did not die. Later on, John was poisoned, but he did not die. Later on, John gets imprisoned and exiled in the island of Patmos. And that's where he was left to die. Peter, we remember the apostle Peter. Peter was imprisoned. He was imprisoned in darkness for an extended period of time. Even while in jail, the historic account says Peter continued to share his faith with those of the fellow prisoners that were there with him. After his imprisonment, Peter was condemned to die by crucifixion. And Peter, because he was so close to Jesus and honored and respected Jesus, said, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus. So he asked them to put the cross upside down. And Peter was crucified upside down for his faith. Many of us know James. James was thrown a hundred feet from the pinnacle of the temple. He was thrown down to his death. They only later found out that after he fell, 10 feet, 100 feet down, he had not died. So what they did, they beat him up until he died in defense of his faith. Simeon, many of us remember Simon the Zealot. His was a scary death. His was a difficult death. Simon was put on a plank and two large, huge men went and brought a saw that had two sides. One of them held one side, the other one held the other. And they placed this saw in the middle of his body. And these strong men asked him if he could denounce or renounce his faith. He said, no, I'm not going to renounce my, my faith. So they went ahead and they sawed his body into half in defense of his faith. That's how James died. So that's how Simeon, the zealot, died. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded in Jerusalem. Some of us remember Bartholomew. Bartholomew's was a scary death. Bartholomew was literally skinned alive. Pieces of his flesh were removed with an, with an instrument, one piece at a time. While they taunted him and asked him to renounce his faith, one piece at a time, his flesh was removed. After he was skinned alive, he had not died. So Bartholomew was beheaded. Andrew was crucified on a cross that was X-shaped. One hand on this side, another on this side, one leg on this side, another on this. Thomas was stabbed. After he was stabbed, his was a scary one. Thomas was tied and a horseman was given what we call the king's lance. And he held the lance and they instructed him to renounce his faith. He said no. So what they decided to do is put a man on horseman with a lance. And the lance was driven through his body. That's how he was stabbed. Jude, the brother of Jesus, was killed with numerous arrows. Matthias was stoned and later on beheaded. Philip was tied to a cross and stoned to death. The same happened to Thaddeus. The same happened to Barnabas. Paul, many of us know the story of Paul and how he was tortured by Emperor Nero. And at the end, after this long and extended torture, Paul was beheaded. There are many that have died for their faith. There are many that have stood for Christ even in the face of the scariest of deaths, they have stood for their faith. 
And as a nation, I just want to challenge us as a nation. We may have thoughts of insecurity in our minds, but allow us as Christians to take the higher ground and think about the 22 heroes of the faith that have gone ahead of us this week and stood for their faith. They were found on their knees. They were found worshiping God. They were found committing to, committed, totally committed to Christ. We have heroes in our country that we have not celebrated as Christians. And as a church, I just want to remind us that these people are telling us something. These people are telling us something. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, To share in his glory, we must first be willing to share in his sufferings. For us to share in his glory, we must be first willing to share in his sufferings. The question I'm asking us is, what kind of Christianity have we embraced? Are the deaths that happened this week an audit of the type of Christianity that I hold? In the face of imminent death, even as grisly and, and as heinous as we saw, am I able to stand for my faith and not compromise my faith? The question I'm asking us is, what happened this week? Is it a test of our faith? Is our faith being tested as Christians? Is my prayer life being tested as a Christian? Is God asking me a question about the faith that I hold? Is my love as a Christian being tested this week by what has happened? Is the depth and the breadth of my love and the height of my love, the love that I say I hold so dear, the love of Christ, is that what is being tested? You know, it costs to be a Christian. It's not easy to be a Christian. And maybe we've gotten into a season as a nation where we're taking for granted the fact that we are believers and we do not understand that there are many that are in opposition to Christ. There are many that are trying to take advantage of us because of our faith. Allow me to remind us today that the ultimate symbol of Christianity is the cross. The ultimate symbol of Christianity is not the crown that we're looking forward to. It's not the paradise that we've been promised. It's not that life forever with Christ that we've been promised. It is the cross. It is the sacrifice that Christ made so that we could be who we are today. And today I'm reminding us that it's not just the 22 students or the many martyrs that have died before. Especially this weekend, we're reminded that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, that went through something similar. Jesus Christ died a miserable, a painful, and a very humiliating death. Jesus Christ died, but the fact is Jesus Christ's death was different than any other death for the sake of the faith. Jesus Christ's death was voluntary. Jesus was not forced to give his life up for us. Jesus was not dragged to the cross. He was not chained and forced to go on to the cross. Jesus voluntarily went to the cross because Jesus was committed to the call of reconciling man to God. And neither the hate or the horror of the crowd that was there at that time Neither the madness nor the mockery of the mob that was there at that time could change his inward mission, his mission of dying for the sins of this world. Even though nothing was more devastating, nothing was more deplorable, nothing was more depraving and despicable as dying like a common criminal, Jesus Christ voluntarily said, I will die this humiliating death because he had a mission that was deep and a mission 
that God had given him. So amidst the bloody sweat, amidst the torn body, amidst the crown of thorns, amidst the pain and amidst the drenched cross, amidst the piercing nails that was in his hands, amidst the blistering sun that he was experiencing, amidst the hurtful betrayal of people that were closest to him, amidst the fact that his disciples has des had deserted him at that particular time, amidst all that was happening, amidst this deep and dense environment of hate, this environment of hate that was all around him, Jesus Christ rose above it and allowed the love of God for the world to endure the pain of the cross. And we're in a similar situation today as a country. Amidst all the hate that is being passed on, amidst all the fear that is being passed on, amidst all the confusion and the tension that is being passed on, the Lord is reminding us that there is a love that God has that can conquer all. There is a love that God has given us as Christians that can conquer all. If we can focus on what Christ did, on the cross and is asking us to do amidst such persecution, amidst such difficulty, amidst such hatred, amidst such fear. Jesus' death was full of irony. Amidst hate, it is a great love that took him. What irony? Allow me to highlight some other ironies that were around this cross that we are celebrating this weekend. Amidst a people that were taunting Jesus Christ and calling him, are you really the king of the Jews? In fact, they call him, yes, you king. And as they mocked him and they taunted him, they did not realize that their mockery was actually true. He was not just king, but he was the king of kings. They even mocked him and prepared a crown of thorns and said, this is the king. They even gave him a garment and said, king. And they taunted him as the king, but they did not know that he was really the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What irony. When Jesus seemed utterly powerless on the cross, there is no more vulnerable position you can ever be put in where you're helpless and you're powerless. In a position that looked so powerless. What they did not know is the irony of that moment is that this man that looked so powerless is actually the most powerful of them all. And Jesus stood there. And they taunted him and told him, if you are the son of God, why don't you get down from that cross and save yourself? Not even anybody else. Save yourself, you powerless, hopeless man on the cross. And Jesus in his mind thought and said, if only you knew that I have the power to call upon the heavenly father and he will send 12 legions of angels to deliver me from this cross. I have the power. But for now, I have voluntarily decided that not my will to be done, but let the will of the Father be done. Another irony around the cross. Someone so powerful could look so powerless for the sake of the mission that God had given him. The third irony around the cross is that a man that looked like he could not save himself, a man that was taunted and asked to save himself, but he looked like he could not even save himself, that same man was not just going to save himself, but he was going to save the whole entire world from sin once and for all. What irony. What irony. The final irony around this cross is that the one that cried out in despair 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one that cried out in seeming hopelessness and despair is the same man that trusted God the most. Is the same one that said, not my will, but let your will be done. Is the same one that said at the end, into your hands I commit my spirit. The same man. Are these parallels that can speak to us as a country today? That there may be a lot of ironies around this week. A nation that looks like it is in despair. Maybe the nation that trusts God more than any other nation on earth. A nation that looks so powerless. Maybe the most powerful of them all. A nation that trusts in God. This week, this week, there may be several ironies in light of what God is telling us this Easter. God did not put a full stop after the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. What seemed like a tragedy was just a comma. Because guess what? After Friday, there is resurrection Sunday. And what looked like a tragedy became a triumph. Is that what God is telling us as a nation? That what looks like a tragedy, God can actually turn it around and make it a triumph for us as a nation. They may have left Jesus Christ in the tomb, but God put Jesus Christ on the throne. Today we declare that the deaths of the students in Garissa this week, we can declare as a church that it should not end up in tragedy. We can declare the triumph of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ upon them. Let me give you this picture. These students may have been left lying on the floor, but guess what? Those students are right now seated at the right hand of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those students are being, they are being hailed as the heroes of the faith right now in the heavens. Those people are receiving a standing ovation by our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as heroes of the faith who lived for Jesus. Today we declare that as a church, the irony is these deaths, these deaths that have happened in this nation, we can as a church refuse to relegate ourselves into hate as a result of what happened this week. We can refuse. We can refuse to be the ones that transmit fear around this country. We can say no. We are going to transmit faith around this country. And we can confess that what happened has just rekindled our faith. That is what persecution has done for the church over the years. Over 2,000 years, any season of persecution has refined the church and has brought the church a flame that the church never had before. It has reminded us of the seriousness of our faith. That's what it can do. It can rekindle our patriotism. It can rekindle our commitment to express the love of Christ. Because the Bible says, how different are you from others if you can love your friends? The difference comes when you have the capacity to love even your enemies. That is what distinguishes us as believers. The Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 says, Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O grave, is your victory? But it says, Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The irony of the cross is that death 
yielded life. The irony of the cross is that death yielded life. Is that where we are as a country right now? Are we in a position to say the irony of what happened is that the death that happened is going to give us a new life as a nation. It's going to give us a renewed zeal as Christians in this nation to stand for Christ even more. And I know right now there are families that are grieving. There are communities that are shattered. Right now there are students whose journey in life has been put on hold by an act so grave. Right now as we speak, a nation has been shaken. But allow us as a country, as Christians in this country, to look at things slightly different. To confess what God's word says upon this nation. We just sang in the beginning, Hakuna Silaha, no weapon that is fashioned against us shall prosper. Is that where we are as a nation? Is that our confession, our confession of victory? Or are we just singing it? God is asking us, what do you believe as an individual right now in light of what happened in our nation? Can we confess that? And can we change the atmosphere of this nation by what we believe, our faith? And let that guide us forward and let that be contagious for our country. I want to spare time as we close our service to pray. To pray. I'll be asking Pastor Kabibi to come as he leads us in prayer. But let me re just read some passages of scripture to, uh, to guide us. This morning I read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, We are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. It goes on to say, so then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed by the day. Is that the state of our nation? Can we confess a renewal that is happening in us in light of what has happened to us? Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. So who shall I be afraid of? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gaze upon his beauty and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling and he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and he's our fortress. Church, let's look at things differently. Let's speak differently. Let's act differently because we have a savior who died for all of us and has purchased victory regardless of what we go through. Shall we stand together even as we pray? Amen. Amen. In agreement with those words, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 116, verses 15, even as we think about those students who suffered a cruel death in the hands of those Al-Shabaab terrorists, the Bible says in Psalms 116, verses 15, that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Today is Resurrection Sunday. And you can look back 2,000 years. And the disciples, after the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, 
Maybe they were somewhere huddled in their rooms. Totally having lost hope. But they did not know that resurrection was going to come. Today is Resurrection Sunday. As Christians, we believe in the resurrection. And even as we pray today, we are telling the Lord God that we believe in him. Because he is the resurrection. That he rose on the third day. That even today as a nation, when we are discouraged, when we are feeling hit by the enemy, we want to remind ourselves that we believe that the Lord is the Lord of the what? Of the what, church? Of the resurrection. Of the resurrection. And we want to go to him in prayer. And we want to pray for this nation. And I want to encourage us as church, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our hearts may be down. We may be feeling discouraged. We may be feeling a lot of pain as we think of those students and the pain they had to suffer. The fear and the anguish. We may be coming today because we are angry with what was going on. We may be blaming others and we are angry that possibly help did not come to those students fast enough. Let us turn this to the Lord in prayer. Let us as a church the 2,000 of us gathered here, let us raise our voices to the throne, to the Lord God Almighty. Let us begin by recognizing who he is. Isaiah saw him in the temple, in Isaiah chapter 6, and he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And though he said, whoa, who am I that I can see the Lord? Because as he saw the Lord, he could see there were angelic beings around him. And they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. God Almighty. And the whole earth is full of his glory. Today I want to say that God's glory is on this country of Kenya. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. God's glory is on this nation. That we may feel defeated, we may feel down, but God's glory is on this country. Let us pray together. Let's call on the Lord Church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you and we want to turn to you reminded by the words of scripture in the book of Psalms chapter 70 as David spoke with you and he said, hasten, O God, to save us. O Lord, come quickly to help us. May those who seek our life be put to shame and confusion. May all who, do, who desire our ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to us, aha, aha, turn back because of your shame. But may all who seek you, Lord, because we seek you, rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, let God be exalted. And Lord, we want to say you are exalted today. You are exalted on high because you're a God who sees everything that nothing passes you, no detail passes your understanding because you're a God who sits on the throne. Lord, we pray that as a church that you will help us to see and grasp the big picture. That despite our pain, our fear, our anger, our frustration, Lord, we pray that may you help us to see things from your perspective. Lord, we are seeing persecution in our time and we are praying that, Lord, may we as your children stand up courageous knowing that our lives are in your hands knowing that if you are confronted with the choice of denying you may we stand with you even if it means death Lord we want to pray like the disciples did in Acts chapter 4 that when the church was persecuted they gathered together and they prayed yes. and they prayed for boldness today Lord we are praying as a church and we are not just praying for Nairobi chapel but we are praying for the church in Kenya. Yes. That the church shall be bold to speak about yes. the salvation of Jesus. Yes. That the church shall speak about a Lord who came in this period, who died on the cross. That we may experience eternity with the Father. And Lord, that's what we are about. The church is about transformation. Lord, we are praying that during this time of pain, may Lord, may you transform your church that your church will be purified that your church will be of those people who know you and who want to serve and who want to live for you 
Lord, we pray that may you intervene on our behalf because, Lord, it is in you that we have taken refuge. Let us never be put to shame. Rescue us and deliver us in your righteousness. Turn your ear to us and save us. Be our rock and our refuge to which we can always go. Give the command to save us for you are our rock and our fortress. Deliver us as a nation, O oh our God, from the hand of the wicked and from the grasp of the evil and cruel men. For you have been our hope, O oh sovereign Lord, our confidence since our youth. Lord, this is our prayer. And as we pray, Lord, as a people, and as we call on the Lord, I want to ask you, church, let us this moment take a moment to pray for everyone in a position of authority in this country. Again, as we did last week, let us pray for the president. We do not know what he's going through at this moment. Let us pray that the wisdom of God will overwhelm him. Let us pray that boldness and courage will come upon him. Let us pray for him that he will choose to do what is right. That he will choose to do what is right before God, even if it comes at a cost. Let us uphold him let us uphold those in government offices as well. That they will choose what is right. Let us pray for the police and the, uh, and, and the other security forces in this country. Let us pray for them that they will see themselves as servants. That they will see themselves as people who have been chosen and called to defend the weak. Lord, let us pray for them. That they will not turn to, to money and seek money first but they will think of this nation. Let us pray for our court systems and our justice systems in this country. Let us pray for our judges and those who have cases before them. Some of them having to deal with criminals and other terrorists, Lord, that they will do the right thing. Pray for our judges. Pray for them, church. Pray for this nation. Pray that the nation of Kenya will be able to rise up to its calling. This is the time to pray, church. Let us call on the Lord that he may intervene at this very moment. Let us call on him. Oh Lord, come. Come as we beseech you. As we call to you, Lord. Lord, we are praying for this nation. That Lord, this nation will be able to rise up. As a nation, a prosperous nation. That prosperity will be found within our borders. Lord, we want to pray against uh, a blame game of blaming one another, especially at this time. But Lord, we shall uh, uh, take the high road of praying for our country, for our leaders at every level. Let us uphold this country before the Lord. And Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, because as your people pray, that, Lord, you hear us from heaven. Lord, our prayer is this, that may your will be done concerning our nation. And, Lord, for the church, we are praying that may the church rise up to its true calling to be an agent of salvation, as you've called us to be, that will be spread the good news and spread the gospel, not only in this nation, but in this continent and in this region and beyond uh, to the farthest uh, part of the earth. Lord, help us to be faithful to what you've called us to be until you come again. Because your coming is soon. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen.